Hey everyone, it's Takuya here, and before things begin, I just wanted to give you a heads up. A lot of you are probably confused because you were expecting the next episode of the African Queen series here with Jenga. And the reason why I'm not doing that one in this specific video is because I've done it repeatedly here and I want to be able to intermix other content into all of this. So to that end, on the topic of historical revisionism and how things are so oftentimes misconstrued within history, I wanted to do an entire series on people and things that have been misconstrued or misunderstood. Complex characters who've been given a bad rap or a good rap in history that perhaps maybe they don't really deserve. History is filled with these stories as oftentimes it's told by the victor. So join me on today's episode and the beginning of a new series, Complex Characters. Hello everyone, it's Takuya here, and welcome back to the History of Everything podcast YouTube channel. Now I'm sure that from the start of this, a lot of you are already familiar with the story of the Titanic. For those of you who have somehow not already heard the story, the RMS Titanic was a luxury steamship, and easily the largest ship afloat at the time that it was created back in 1912. Unfortunately for the ship, simultaneously it would also sink in the early hours of April 15th in 1912 on its maiden voyage. This being after some sweeping an iceberg, which would not end well for the majority of its passengers. Of the 2,240 passengers and crew that were on board, around 1,500 people ended up losing their lives over the course of this disaster. And as you can see from the images playing behind me here, the Titanic has inspired all different kinds of books, movies, shows, any number of forms of media that depict this, as it's one of the biggest tales in our recent human history. Especially this one, arguably the most famous one, the 1997 Titanic movie starring Kate Winslow and Leonardo DiCaprio, easily the most famous of all of these depictions of the Titanic. And over the course of this last century, Century, the ship has easily served as one of the best stories that you could possibly have, a cautionary tale of human hubris. But what if I went and told you that one of the key parts of this entire story was a giant load of crap that was manufactured specifically in order to increase your hatred towards a specific person? You'd probably be surprised, right? Well, allow me to explain and tell the unfortunate story of one man, Joseph Bruce Ismay, the highest ranking officer to survive the sinking and simultaneously the man who would be blamed in America and Britain as the one who would lead the Titanic to its doom. You see, my friends, Ismay was the eldest son of Henry Thomas Ismay, the guy who was actually in charge of and owned the White Star Line. This being the company that owned the Titanic and also a whole other series of luxury liner passenger ships. It was only after his father's death in 1889 that he ended up taking over the company, and it was under his direction that the company would really make a push towards increasing its number of luxury passenger liners, which were supposed to be unparalleled. Simultaneously, over the course of this time, he became known as a major stickler for the rules and company policy, following all of these to a T, and making sure that the crew and people did the same. Unfortunately for him, though, in April of 1912, Ismay was aboard the Titanic during its maiden voyage, and it was over the course of this maiden voyage, as we said earlier, that it would hit an iceberg and ultimately sink. Due to the fact that Ismay had a high-ranking position within the White Star Line, he would have been one of the first passengers who would have been informed about the grievous damage that the ship was facing. And nobody except Ismay perhaps understood just how serious this whole thing was. After all, he was actually the one who ended up reducing the number of lifeboats that were aboard the vessel from 48 down to 16, which was the minimum standard that was required at the time. I can only imagine what it was that was going through his mind as he sailed away on his little lifeboat watching the Titanic sink behind him, knowing that he was the person that was responsible for this. Among all of the things that this man is blamed for, this is arguably the most realistic of all of them. It's the most real. The reason why he had advocated for it in the first place was specifically because the Titanic was supposed to be a luxury liner, that he wanted to maximize the amount of space that was going to be available for first-class passengers. Extra lifeboats were just something that got in the way of the view. But see, it wasn't just the reduced number of lifeboats that was the reason why the public hated this man. He was specifically despised for saving himself when 1,500 other passengers, the majority of the rest of the people on the vessel, would go down with the ship. Ismay would survive by jumping into one of the lifeboats, claiming one of the precious spots for himself. And this was going to be a very fateful decision for him, one that was going to end up having him be vilified by the media and being cast as the coward of the Titanic, or Joseph Brute Ismay. And this is where it got really bad for the guy. The world was angry at this point and just wanted someone to blame. Considering the fact that he was the highest ranking officer of the ship to survive, and also the fact that not many people survived, this is something that would end up making him a natural target. That, and the fact that he had also made an enemy of the press in earlier years, and this was a chance for some of them to get a little bit of a one-up against him. In this specific case, the newspapers that were controlled by a man by the name of William Randolph Hearst, who was a newspaper magnate and easily one of the richest people in all of America, well, it wasn't going to go well for him. Ismay had actually met Hearst years before, back when he was a White Star agent in New York City. 
And the two men from the beginning very strongly disliked one another. In Hearst's case, he was angry at Ismay because Ismay would simply refuse to cooperate him, wouldn't answer his questions, wouldn't do these things for anything that he wanted to run a story on, and this is something that would end up poisoning Hearst against him and his character. Almost 20 years after their initial meeting, it was the Hearst syndicated press that would end up running a vicious campaign against Ismay, including things like running a full-page cartoon that would depict Ismay in a lifeboat watching the Titanic sink, and captioning it, This is J. Brute Ismay. And also, we respectfully suggest that the emblem of the White Star be changed to a yellow liver, essentially anything they could do in order to mark him as a coward. Many other very public accusations would follow, which would just do more to turn the public and people specifically against this one man. The most serious allegation in any of these specifically concerned Ismay's alleged interference with the navigation of the Titanic. Various books and recent films and TV series and other things about the disaster specifically enlarge upon the Hearst stories. And what we see now is very much the stereotype of a businessman, a person who is only interested in money and power, and that's pretty much it. Human life really is something that would only come secondary to him. Following the Hearst Press depiction of Ismay, every subsequent film about the Titanic has specifically depicted Ismay as a villain, starting with the 1943 Nazi propaganda film Titanic, where he is depicted as merely being this corrupt British businessman who forces Captain Smith to sail the Titanic recklessly at full speed into ice-infested waters in order to try and set a speed record. A similar portrayal would follow in the 1996 miniseries about the Titanic. And in James Cameron's 1997 film, Ismay is often villainized due to the film's inclusion of a scene that is based off an eyewitness account of a first-class passenger by the name of Elizabeth Lines, who, after the sinking, stated that she overheard Ismay going and telling Captain Smith that they needed to increase speed in order to make headlines. Or rather, specifically to beat the transatlantic crossing of the Titanic sister ship, the RMS Olympic. The James Cameron movie that you can see right here is probably the depiction that a number of you are the most familiar with. But that is a depiction and an action that was deliberately done by the director in order to give you as much hatred as possible towards this specific man. There was a man by the name of Luden Brown who was one of several consultants to work on the Cameron film and he stated that he thought that the antagonistic depiction that they gave of Ismay in this was just completely unfair to him. But then every time he tried to voice or challenge this, his feelings were dismissed and they were ordered under no circumstance to change the script, specifically because they were expected to have this. This is what the public wants to see. This is what they were expected to see. There would be even more depictions that would follow all this because in the 2012 miniseries Titanic, this would depict Ismay as a bigot who would order non-British crew members to be locked down during the sinking and just sacrifice their lives. The crazy thing is, J. Bruce Ismay did not order to put the pressure on the commander or the engineer or anyone on that ship to increase speed. That was not something that ever seemed to have actually happened. On the North Atlantic, there were several defined lanes or tracks that all passenger and cargo liners had to follow. The Northern track, taken during the months of August to December, was approximately 200 miles shorter than the Southern that existed between January to July. The Titanic was sailing on the Southern track as her sister ship had done in June of 1911, and the Titanic, in common with her sister, had adopted the White Star's policy of vessels of huge size and moderate speed, affording great comfort to passengers. They didn't want to speed things along, specifically because the entire purpose of this journey was to make it as luxurious and enjoyable as possible. Pretty much all thoughts of a race or speed or anything like that have been given up in the decades prior because there really was no point at this. When you had a ship that was as large as the Titanic, this utilized a huge amount of fuel, of resources, of food, of everything. And the number of passengers who would be booking their trips during this time would have made plans ahead of time specifically for when they had arrived. Delays in travel are bad, but simultaneously, if you arrive early, then this meant that for a passenger liner, any of the plans that the luxury passengers had already made prior to this, well, those were now going to end up getting screwed up, and their stores and everything they calculated would no longer be accurate. And that's just the logic part. Ismay himself is recorded as being a stickler for the rules who had multiple times before refused to speed up his passenger ships in order to arrive early, even at the request of his company, out of concerns for safety and enjoyment of the passengers. So the depiction that it has of him here is not only uncharitable, it is outright false for his character. Now, most of the material that we're talking about at this point did not come to light immediately. It didn't come into light during the American or the British inquiries, but rather it came to light during a district court case specifically concerning the Titanic victims. 
or rather regarding the Oceanic Steam Navigation Company's attempt to limit its own liability to not have to pay out a bunch of money during this massive disaster. Because of the nature of the action that was taking place, because we're talking about a massive, massive lawsuit here, there was a lot of money that was involved in the case at this point, which meant that there was a lot of incentives specifically to get witnesses that would be able to corroborate certain facts. Certain facts, including things like having it so that Ismay specifically gave the orders to increase speed so that they would have someone to blame and be able to shift that onto someone alone. The evidence that we're talking about at this point here is circumstantial at best, and at worst, it is outright false. A deliberate misrepresentation meant to skew things in favor of, or rather not in favor of, against the favor of one specific person. An example of this is the answers that were given by Miss Emily Ryerson, whose cross-examination I actually had have the list right here so that I will be able to read it aloud for all of you now. Quote, question, questioner, he, referring to Ismay, didn't say anything to you about speeding the ship up to get out of the ice. Answer, no, that was merely the impression that was left on my mind. Questioner, my question is not whether he spoke about putting on more boilers or going faster, but I am confining my question to whether he said or suggested to you anything that indicated that they were going to increase the speed in order to get out of the ice. Answer, as I say, that was merely the impression left on my mind. Questioner, nothing was said? Answer, no, not in so many words. That was the impression left on my mind. Questioner, you don't wish to be understood that Titanic was trying to make a speed record across the Atlantic? Answer, I should say my impression was they were going to show, surprise us all by what she could do on that voyage. Questioner, as a matter of fact, was it discussed whether she should get in on Tuesday night or Wednesday morning? Answer, Yes. Question. Among passengers. Answer. Yes. And in the conversation with Mr. Ismay also, there was some question about it because I discussed it with my husband after I got down to the cabin. Question. So you wouldn't say Mr. Ismay said they were going to make a record? Answer. No, I wouldn't say that he said those words. His attitude or his language, we assumed that's all it was, that we were trying to make a record. I wouldn't say he used those words. There is quite literally no evidence from this to suggest that Ismay ever put pressure upon Captain Smith to increase the speed, or that he told passengers that they were going to have the Titanic make a record. That just doesn't appear to have been a thing. And then this, along with other half-remembered conversations by passengers, no doubt proving that he in fact said these things, are just details that ended up being corroborated by what people were seeing in the press at the time that were viciously attacking him. If Smith and Ismay were out to make a record from the very beginning, why would they not have turned on the boilers from the very beginning in order to be able to increase their speed? Why wait until the trip was already almost done? More importantly, there is not a single piece of evidence that corroborates this story between the captain, his engineers, or any other kind of crew member on that ship. There is nothing that supports these allegations. It's just what was being said. The newspapers, particularly in the United States, may have expected Ismay to sacrifice his own life when the ship was sinking, and the story of a cowardly ship owner who was more willing to sacrifice the lives of his crew members and also his passengers in order to save his own skin? Well, come on. Guys, this is the 1900s, and we're talking about newspapers. This was not a time when they merely reported the news. This was a time when they made the news. And that kind of story, telling that to the public, riling up people and getting their numbers going, well, that was too good of an offer to pass up. It is true that Ismay did escape in a lifeboat, but this was only after he had been done helping people escape already. He was helping with the loading and lowering of several other lifeboats, and only when he was sure there were no other women and children that were aboard there at the time in the vicinity did he end up hopping on one of the lifeboats himself in order to escape. He, in fact, ended up acquitting himself significantly better than other crew members and passengers who had taken to flight leaving significantly earlier, oftentimes with only half-filled boats. These statements were only further corroborated by Augustus H. Wilkman, who was actually the person who was the Titanic chief ship barber, and he would provide a very useful statement to the United States Senate Committee on Commerce Inquiry that was chaired by Senator William Alden Smith. He said, and I quote, I helped to launch the boats, and there seemed to be a shortage of women. When I was on E-deck, I met the captain returning from G-deck, who had been there with Mr. Andrews, and the captain was on the bridge at that time. I did not think there was any danger. What happened after the orders were given? Well, instructions were given to get the passengers into lifeboats and get on deck from all the staterooms. Did you see Mr. Ismay? Yes, I saw Mr. Ismay helping to load the boats. Did you see him get to a boat? Yes, he got in along with Mr. Carter because there was no women in the vicinity of the boat. This boat was the last to leave to the best of my knowledge. 
He was ordered into the boat by the officer in charge. I think Mr. Ismay was justified in leaving in the boat at that time. I'm reading it word for word for what was said at the time. It just really seems to be the case that over the course of this entire incident, Ismay did the best that he could to help people, but past a certain point, there wasn't really anyone left to help that was going to be given priority. In the British Inquiry report, Lord Mercy would go on to defend Ismay in writing, saying, as to the attack on Mr. Bruce Ismay, it resolved itself to the suggestion that occupying the position of managing director of the steamship company, some moral duty was imposed upon him to wait on board until the vessel had foundered. I do not agree. Mr. Esme, after rendering assistance to many passengers, found C collapsible, the last boat on the starboard side actually being lowered. No other people were there at the time, there was room for him, and he jumped in. Had he not jumped in, he would have simply added one more life to the many that were lost on that day. But the thing is, to so the papers and the movie directors and all the other people that would come after, these facts just didn't really seem to matter. Ismay just seemed to be the perfect person to be a target for the public displays of anger. It's a popular belief that what happened afterwards is that, hounded by the media and plagued with regret, Ismay would go on to retreat into solitude and become a depressed recluse for the rest of his remaining life. But the thing is, although he definitely was haunted by all these events that took place, he didn't hide from any of it. He would donate a significant sum to the pension fund for widows of the disaster, and instead of avoiding responsibility for the entire thing, he actually would help to pay out the multitude of insurance claims of the victim's relatives. In the years that would follow, Ismay and the insurance companies, they would go on to pay out hundreds of thousands of pounds to the victims of this disaster. Far from trying to avoid things in the first place, he did anything he possibly could to help. The unfortunate thing for Ismay is that he would never really get his reputation back. Even to this day, a large number of people, thanks to these films, thanks to these productions, they still view Ismay as a coward who sacrificed people all in the name of saving his own skin. The view that people have of him thanks to media is uncharitable at best, and and an outright lie at the worst. He is a very complex and misunderstood character when it comes to things in history, just like many other people. And I really hope that over the course of talking about this today, that I was able to show that here for you all. Everyone, thank you very much for watching. This has been Stakui with the History of Everything podcast. And if you would like to support this channel, then I ask that you like, comment, and subscribe. Another thing that you can do if you want to support us monetarily is by checking us out on Patreon. And also, simultaneously, there is a History of Everything podcast coffee that, while I don't have as much in the way of merch here, right now, I do have my own coffee, and I guarantee you it is delicious and chocolatey. So if you do me a favor by checking that out and supporting my channel through purchasing that, you're doing yourself a favor and also me. Thank you once again, all of you for watching, and I will see you all here next time. Goodbye, everyone.